Hi, my name is Sarah Chen. My name is Esther Tao. And we hope everyone is doing well in these unprecedented times. We are two student research contributors at Space ML, where we've been working on a project related to applications of satellite imagery. Our work over the course of these past couple of months has involved reducing the effects of SWAT gaps in unsupervised machine learning. So you might be wondering, what exactly are SWAT gaps and why are they important? Well, this is a screenshot of NASA Worldview. The black splotches that you currently see on Earth are no data areas called swath gaps. They're usually in a spindle shape at the equator, but they're also found in other shapes as well. And these swath gaps are regions of Earth that NASA's Terra and Aqua satellites have not been able to capture. This is due to a lack of coverage between the satellite orbits. Because both satellites travel periodically between the North and South Poles, at high latitudes there is sufficient satellite data overlap to collect complete imagery of the region. However, in regions adjacent to the equator, since the total circumference is larger, there are gaps between the satellite swath bandwidths, leading to uncollected data. Essentially, these regions of missing data are a result of the gaps between the orbit paths of NASA's Terra and Aqua satellites. What about these missing regions, Sarah? Well, these black splotches occur because at certain times of the year, the Arctic and Antarctic regions receive little to no sunlight. Thus, there's insufficient light to illuminate this region's landmarks. So although these swath gaps are not a large percentage of worldview's total Earth data, they still have a significant effect on space science unsupervised learning tasks. Don't just take it from me, though. Our project is being conducted alongside NASA's impact team, where we've obtained end input um, that swath gaps actually provide a significant issue in training computer vision algorithms for image recognition. So we know that these swath gaps are a known real world problem and more than just an eyesore. So here's why. Let's zoom into one specific location of this worldview image. As we can see from this screenshot of the recent tropical cyclone Yasa taken from worldview data, this image contains missing data, which is part of a swath gap. Though the swath gaps may seem small, past research has concluded that unsupervised computer vision models trained on Earth imagery containing swath gaps tend to learn the swath gap rather than the image's more important features. For example, Algorithms that are given no prior baseline in identifying satellite images may look at this image of a cyclone and treat the swath gap as the image's most important feature, rather than the swirl of the waves that identify a cyclone. So this means that if a region of interest includes even one tiny corner of the swath gap, it renders the entire image unusable for unsupervised learning. This proves to be a significant challenge, especially if the observation is a relatively rare but important phenomenon like a forest fire or a hurricane. So in order to address this problem, we first needed to generate a data set where a portion of the images contain swath gaps, similar to real worldview conditions. And why couldn't we just use an actual worldview data? We couldn't use raw worldview data for this task because the vast majority of that satellite imagery is unlabeled and the labels were necessary to assess the success and accuracy of our solution methods to be discussed later on. So instead we use the UC Merced dataset to create our own dataset simulating worldview spot gaps. For our purposes, we selected 10 of the 21 classes and five images from each class that each had one of the following swath gap areas, where the majority of images contained no swath gaps. We represented the swath gaps as squares with an area of 20% of the image. This mimicked a real data set of worldview images as only those with less than 25% of missing data were considered an imagery categorization. And further, the vast majority of the worldview satellite images are still unaffected by swath gaps. Then, once we had our data set with random images containing swath gaps, we began testing our hypothesis that swath gaps would poorly affect the accuracy of satellite imagery classification. We modeled the similarity, the swath gap problem through the use of a similarity search that takes an input query image and returns its four most similar images from the data set using an auto encoder. For more information on autoencoders or similarity searches, we'd be happy to answer your questions at our live session or through our paper. We began our similarity searches with a baseline test on an original beach query image. As you can see, the similarity search performed with high accuracy and returned four images of real beaches. However, when we reconducted our search on another beach, this time with simulated swath gaps in the bottom left corner, our results differed vastly. 
With the, present, with the presence of the missing data, the returned most similar images now included airplanes, rivers, and intersections, all of which were definitely not beaches. Through countless reiterations of similarity searches of, on various query images, we concluded that the computer algorithm was recognizing the location of the SWAT gaps as the primary feature of these victim images. And this concludes the flaw of the issue that we discussed earlier. The SWAT gaps are a major problem because too much of the attention of the computer vision models is focused on these SWAT gaps in the data rather than the more forecasting features of the image. Obviously a major flaw when our goal is for the computer vision models to correctly identify and categorize satellite imagery. Hence, we can see that soft gaps, despite seeming small in size, are actually significant problems that need to be addressed in order for computer vision models to properly classify satellite imagery. This leads to the solution Esther and I have been devising for the past couple of months. However, before we get into our proposed solution, an important role we have to discuss is that of convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, and activation maps. We go into more detail about these in our paper, and we'd also be happy to address them further in our live session. However, for now, let's look at a specific example of an activation map that, at a high level, works similarly to an edge detector or a filter. For our demonstration, we use the ResNet50 pre-trained network. And although it was not trained specifically on Earth data, its speed and accessibility make it the optimal pre-trained network for our purposes. As you can see here, the image on the left is the original image, whereas the image on the right is one of its activation maps. Things get pretty tricky, however, when you start to look at images with swath gaps. As you can clearly see here, the swath gaps stand extremely out in the activation map. It's evident that the map is paying way too much attention to these swath gaps, causing the model to learn the location of the swath gaps as the image's identifying feature during training. This means that the model assumes that images belong to the same category if they contain similarly placed swath gaps, rather than if the images have similar features that classify what the satellite imagery actually is. So how can we fix this issue? Our approach to this problem was to deactivate the swath. We quantified our results to the accuracy of the autoencoder and visualized them through activation maps. We use these activation maps as a preliminary metric to more rigorously visualize how well the swath gaps were filled. So what are some of the strategies we used? In order to fool these algorithms and trick them into not seeing the swath gaps, our first solution idea was to fill the swath with random RGB pixel values. We wanted the activation map to ignore the swath gap area and pay attention to the true image features by filling the data gaps with a featureless pattern. However, as you can see from these images, even though the activation maps were focused less on the random RGB inside the swath gap, they were still very focused on the edges. So Esther, what was next? The next filling method that Sarah and I decided to implement was to try to get rid of these blatant borders. So what if instead of random RGB pixels, we took pixels from the very image itself? This way, the colors of the filled in swath gap would match the scheme of the background image, making the swath have a lesser effect on the activation map. As you can see from with the results on the screen, there is in fact a lesser effect on the activation maps, but of course we still weren't satis satisfied. So how could we do even better? This is our nearest neighbor fill strategy, more than a bit more powerful. Essentially, it's a dynamic version of the last strategy where each pixel of the swath is now being filled with a random RGB value from within a certain radius. The radius of the RGB value is drawn from, is drawn from decreases as you get closer to the edge of the swath gap, which is how we get this gradient look. As you can see by these activation maps, there's a tremendous amount of improvement in lowering the effects of the swath gaps on the activation maps. Now let's look at some more images. Let's say that we're, that we're inputting these images into a CNN in order to train our algorithm to classify these images and others like it into beach and airplane categories. If these images had swath gaps, imagine how much of a pain they would be to run through our CNN. Except rewind, they did have swath gaps. We just filled them in with our nearest neighbor's fill strategy. Even for the naked eye, it's hard to detect the location of some of these swath gaps. So imagine the effect that this algorithm would have on disguising the swath gaps for an AI model. But no need to imagine. Let's look at some real results. First, though, we needed a baseline. We started with our original image on the left and asked the autoencoder to match it with its most similar core images within the data set. As you can see, it did a pretty good job. But then came our problem. 
Here, we again started with an image and asked the algorithm to return back four nearest neighbors. However, as you can see here, the algorithm was focused way too much on the appearance of the swath gap and instead output images that were clearly not in the same category. The algorithm thought that these images were similar due to the nature of the swath gaps rather than the similarities in the background image, which is what we're really looking for. So Esther, how did we fix this? Well, like we mentioned earlier, we started off by filling the swath caps with random RGB values. The results were better than the swath training data with the autoencoder correctly identifying one of the supposedly nearest neighbors. Next, we tried our second filling method, taking random RGB pixels from other parts of the image. This was another step up from our previous filling method as seen by the autoencoder correctly identifying two out of the three, four images. And finally, let's look at our third method, filling the swath with nearest neighbor pixels. The results showed that all four of the nearest neighbors were in the correct category. So now how can we put things in a bigger perspective of these swath gap fillings applications in real machine learning? Well, in supervised learning where images start off with already having labels, these swath gaps are not as important. With a supervised network, the algorithm already knows what patterns to look for in an image. For example, suppose we have a network that's supposed to classify whether an image is a hurricane or not. If the training is supervised, the CNN already knows which pattern to look for that identify a hurricane. And so the swath gaps are less of a problem. However, in unsupervised learning, filling the missing data is valuable. Since the training images don't have labels, the neural network has no metric of comparison or accuracy detection. So it could pick up on whatever feature is most prominent. In this data set, it's of course the swath gaps. This means that since our method is aimed at unlabeled data, it is widely generalizable to obscuring any region of an image from CNN pattern recognition. This can potentially impact large scale unannotated data sets with swath gaps from worldview space data domains. So to summarize, we use CNN activation maps and autoencoder similarity searches respectively to analyze the results for swath gap data before and after applying our filling methods. In doing so, we accomplished our goal of disguising the swath gaps through the adaptive nearest neighbor pixel filling method. Our next steps are now to do a more thorough and quantitative analysis of the data to add numbers and graphs to our observations, including real satellite data and benchmarks. Thank you so much for listening, and we'd love to answer any questions you have at our live section, session. Yes, thank you again, and please reach out to our emails or paper with any questions or comments. We hope to see you soon.